imagine taking your generosity to the next level, impacting more lives and leaving a godly legacy for generations to come. Get ideas and strategies to do just that when you listen to these personal stories from high-level kingdom champions. The Kingdom Investor Podcast showcases business leaders who have moved from success to significance, sharing how they use worldly wealth for kingdom impact. Discover how they grew in generosity, impacted more lives, and built godly legacies. You'll find motivation, inspiration, and practical steps to grow as a kingdom investor. Hello, Thomas, and welcome to the Kingdom Investor Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Daniel. Thanks for having me on. This is great. Yeah, I'm excited about our conversation and learning more about eCatalyst. And would you maybe share a little bit about what's going on just right now in day-to-day, day-to-day life? What's maybe a highlight from this week? Sure. Yeah. This week, we've been really working on getting a for-profit started in Ethiopia. And Ahmed was hoping to join us, but unfortunately, his internet connection is is really slow right now. But yeah, so we're trying to get an, a for-profit incubator-style model going in Ethiopia. We're very excited about it. We're getting a bunch of cohorts started, helping a lot of entrepreneurs. And I just, yeah, I don't know. That's been the highlight of my last couple of years in some ways. This is just, I'm so excited to be doing this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited to learn more about that and also to hear your personal story about what really matters to you and and how you live your life. So do you mind praying for just this time and our listeners? Sure, let's do that. Lord Jesus, I just want to thank you for your grace and for your mercy. I thank you for this time uh, with Daniel and with all the listeners that are out there. I just pray, Father, that you would bless our conversation that you bless the words that come out of Daniel's mouth and out of my mouth. And Father, I just pray that in all things, Lord, that you would be sovereign and that you would rule. Lord, that uh, that this would be a process guided by you. We thank you for, for all that you do for us. And we just pray for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you share maybe a few highlights from your personal journey and then kind of lead into how eCatalyst came about? Sure. Yeah. So I grew up in Georgia a long time ago, long time Georgia Bulldogs fan, long, long before they actually won any national championships. <laughs> and, uh, or actually I, I was my son's age when, when, when we won the first one and that was back in 1980. So it was a long time ago, but yeah, I, I grew up, I, I think I grew up believing I was in the, in an Episcopal church and I, I really felt like I wanted to work with the poor, whoever the, the poor were. I, I went to, I went to a school up in upstate. I went to Cornell up in New York. And actually, just just one story that came out of that. A summer of my junior year, I went to Haiti. I was uh, this was back in the snail mail days. So I like sent one letter to a person in my church who sent one to Cap Haitian, who sent one to the guy out in the mountains, and it sort of worked its way back. And after two of those, I showed up at an airport with a guitar and and no real clue about what I was doing. And for the next three months, I was up in the mountains of Haiti. I was the only white boy in a, in a two hour drive in any direction. And it was, a, it was a crazy time. It was fantastic. I mean, life transforming. I learned Creole. I preached in Creole by the time I was done. But the, one of the most transformative moments was actually in a small conversation I had with a couple of teenagers after an English class, which I tried to teach English. I was, I was terrible at it. But <laughs> these guys, we, we, yeah, these guys were 17, 18. I was 20 one ish, you know, I was a fairly young guy, so just a couple years older than these guys. And we were talking about what do you want to do with your life? And I said, and I still remember the phrase, I want to work with Moon Key Pop, you know, people who are poor. And they said, that's great. Yeah. What are you going to do? <laughs> and I realized nobody had ever asked me that question before. And I had seen the videos, you know, I'd seen videos of people that looked like me, you know, white people walking into African looking villages and everybody seemed excited that they were there and happy that they were coming. And there was this kind of sense that it was just better because they showed up. And I thought, man, I want to be that guy. I want to be the guy that shows up and things just get better. And I realized, hey, I'm not treating these people like people. I'm treating them as, you know, my fantasy world, as it were. And my fantasy was just getting demolished with this this one question. And I realized if I'm going to do something, I, you know, if I really want to help people, I need to do something that benefits them in a way that truly is beneficial. And fast forward another 20 years, I did seminary. I was in the Middle East for 10 years. I was doing business over there. I've started seven or eight businesses. And I came back here and felt God putting that calling back on me in a way that said, this is the time. 
Right. And I connected up with a guy who was doing uh, entrepreneurial ecosystems. And it struck me that this, of all the things that could really change an environment, was the thing that could do that. Ecosystems being you know, that space that actually allows local businesses to grow and start creating jobs and that kind of thing. Think of the petri dish, you, you know, in your high school biology class. You know, it's you're not just planting single businesses, but you're creating an environment where stuff just starts bubbling up. And that that's how economic growth starts happening. It doesn't happen through charity. It happens through through people taking control of their own economic destinies and creating the jobs within their own culture and really creating that kind of economic growth that can really change things. And that's what I decided I wanted to invest in. eCanada spun out of that because we really wanted to focus on some specific communities. And we've been doing this now for two and a half years, and we're just really excited about the model that's that's developed out of that. Yeah, that's that's really neat and, and interesting and excited to hear more. But how did, I guess, what was the challenge or problem that you guys saw in the marketplace that you were like, hey, this is the solution? Or, or can you share may, maybe more about the genesis behind that? Sure, sure. I think part of it comes from a frustration of the process of, that most of us go through when we're giving out charity. You know, that, that charity tends to be money that's spent in a way that comes out of pity most of the time. We, we, we Americans have this image of the starving African child, and we tend to give to that. Sure. You know, we want to we wanna have an impact right away. But the problem is that when you feed somebody today, then feed them tomorrow, when you're in Turkey and you've had a earthquake, absolutely, the people need stuff. When, you're, when your house burns down, you need things. Right. In America, we, we have insurance, and that's what covers some of those things. But in a lot of places, they don't have anything. So we need to get them aid. But when that aid continues after two or three years, what you've done is you've gotten people dependent upon that aid because they're not building anything themselves. Out. And so part of what we're realizing is that if we really want to change communities, not just help the starving child today, but really change the trajectory of his life over the course of you know the next 10 or 15 years, the way to do that is to help people around him, his, his parents, the, the people that, that could provide jobs to him start businesses that are theirs, that they own, and that they can really want to invest in in a way that changes things. But the problem with that is that the economic environments just really make it difficult to create sort of these middle income businesses. You can do a lot of micro business and micro business is great. It helps families get off of, of poverty, but it doesn't really move the needle forward as far as economics go. So when you can help people start seeing a pathway and help getting them the capital that they need to start trying new ideas and growing businesses that can hire 10, 50, 100, 500 people, you're really beginning to change the entire space economically of that, of that community. Yeah, that's so how do you guys actually implement that solution? So that, the, that's what we've been working on over the last two and a half years is really figuring out how does this model work? And obviously, we want to work with entrepreneurs because... They're the backbone of the entire process. So we've done some cohorts. We've been using the MIT method, which is part of what I had used before, which is fantastic stuff. But what we really wanted to do is figure out how do we get this in a way that even the engine of economic growth becomes a locally owned process. So the way we're, we've set it up now is our U.S. entity is a 501c3. So we're charity based, which means that we're running off of charitable dollars, but we're helping we're using this charity to support creating for-profit entities right now in Ethiopia in a way that it's decentralized incubator, which means that we're, that incubator, that entity partners with different organizations in Ethiopia, starts creating cohorts within those organizations, which means we can start lots of cohorts and have the care and the capacity for each one of the entrepreneurs there and get 100 entrepreneurs going. And that as they grow and gain traction and gain revenue, we move them centrally into smaller and smaller cohorts until we get them into an incubation community of those that are really beginning to scale those businesses. And that's how we develop revenue, but it's also how we start really growing things. Because even number 97 out there, A, he could start a business that could hire two people, which would be amazing. But he's also watching that one guy that got all the way up there. And he's thinking, man, next time around, I want to be that guy. And we're starting to create inspiration that gives people the chance to be able to move up. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so that's how that's how we're doing it. It's, this, it's a for-profit decentralized incubator 
in each country supported by the U.S. 501c3 that then gives them content and advice and vision and capacity. But ultimately, we want them to own it and run it and take over. And, uh, and then we want to move to other places. Is there a microfinance component or a savings group or what are the other like financial pieces to that? Yes. So micro business, again, micro business is a fantastic thing, but it's not what we're doing. Savings groups as well. Though we're doing some that we've actually got one of our businesses that is doing a larger style savings group, which is very, very cool. Good. But again, what micro business does is you get $100 or $500 to somebody, you get them a sewing machine or a goat or something like that. And they can start sustaining their family. And that's fantastic stuff. But it doesn't really move. Like I said, it doesn't create jobs necessarily. It doesn't actually change the economy. So what we're saying is we want that micro business to happen, but we also need to build it into the middle of the SME, the yeah. small medium enterprise space. And so there is a microfinance component to that because if you think about the way you start a business in the U.S., we talk about the, the three F's money, the friends, family, and fool's money. <laughs> um, this is that, that crazy uncle down the street that says, hey, I believe in you, kid. You know, and he's got 5,000 bucks and you can, you can try something. You can start out on something. And you need to have that kind of capital or else you never get to experiment. You never get to try a crazy idea. You never get to, to start on something. Yeah. Over there, their three F's don't have that kind of money. Yeah. So what we're trying to do is we are trying to get a micro finance process going for growth oriented businesses so they can experiment, they can try new ideas. It's high risk stuff, but you have to do it and you have to diversify over a broad field in order to really start creating that SME space that can, that can start transforming communities. So yes, there is a microfinance element, but it's not micro business. It's small loans that help people move up, get the data that they need so they can get in front of an angel investor eventually and say, yes, we took $5,000. We've spent three weeks selling everything and we got 90% of our products sold. We know we can do this, you know, or whatever it is. Can you share maybe a story of a quick or easy success or early success that you've had in the process? Sure. I mean, we've done prototypes. We did a prototype in money for India on a sort of an online thing. We're still during the pandemic, so we couldn't actually show up in person, unfortunately, and realize that we've got to have the community there. We've got to have the in-person community. We did, we've done four different cohorts in two different locations in Rwanda, worked with about 300 entrepreneurs, great stuff. Again, though, we worked in the church, which was an Anglican church that was there and loved the process. But unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, at churches over there, it's hard to get out of a nonprofit mindset. And there's always that conversation at the end that says, hey, this guy needs $5,000. We say, okay, let's see his financials. What's his plan? How's he going to go to market? And they're like, oh, no, no, he doesn't have any of that, but he's a really good guy. You should give him $5,000. You know, and it's, and it's just, they have a heart for their people. They want to get their people money, which is understandable, but it's not building business. So we still want to keep working there. And we've, we've got some people that are beginning to build more for-profit stuff there. But in Ethiopia, part of what we have is we have a fantastic team, uh, a team of, of guys that have come out of the incubator space in Ethiopia. They've been frustrated with that. And they're really trying to do something different. And through that, we've had a cohort there since January of 2022. So it's been going on for a little bit over a year. We've already got seven businesses that are launching out of that. We've got three major loans that have gone out, two of which have already been paid back and now we're seeking larger loans. So we're really beginning to see some success in this model. And we feel like we've now got six new organizations, all of which want to start cohorts. And we're beginning our first three in the next three months. So it's exciting, exciting stuff. I think on a Business level, we've got two ladies who are trying to create the DoorDash for laundry, which I think is amazing. They're trying to put an app together. So, you know, you're a single guy, you you say, hey, I've got three loads of laundry. Somebody shows up at your door, they take your laundry, they bring it back a few hours later, it's folded, it's pressed, it looks good, you know, just like you'd get at home or whatever it is. We've got another group that is doing an investment vehicle for poultry farms. So they're helping local investors invest one to $4,000 in a cycle, four month cycle of a poultry farm, get the farmers up and going, get them the capital that they need. And then when they finish the four month cycle, they can return investment to the investors. So it's both helping local farmers and helping local investors find investment. So those are a couple of the, the seven businesses we got going there. I'm just, I'm really excited about the creativity and the scrappiness of the entrepreneurial system in Ethiopia. They just need help and they need community and they need to be able to work together. That's part of what we're helping them do is build that community that says, hey, you're not alone. 
and there's people around you who want to help you. Where do you see this going in the near future? I want to take it all sorts of different places. But I mean, right now, we've got a couple of leaders in Rwanda that are beginning to build some cohorts. They're coming outside of the church. We want to go back in there and really help them once we've got the model finished in Ethiopia. But the other, I mean, not finished. I feel like we've got the model now. We just need to run it through all the way and ensure that, you know, show that we can really make this happen. But I spent, like I said, I spent 10 years in the Middle East. I spent uh, a lot of that learning Arabic, and uh, and now that Arabic is 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 going to waste here in Colorado Springs, which, you know, I love Colorado Springs, but then there's a part of me that wants to get back up into that part of the world. Yes. So uh, we've got some places in Cairo and some Lebanon. There's actually a couple of other spots in North Africa, which I, I can't necessarily tell you about, but um, some there's some great ideas of being able to do that. We've also got spots in Uganda and Pakistan. So there's... There's no shortage of people who want to see real growth happen. It's just helping us get to them in a way that can serve them well, get them the capital they need. That's part of what we're trying to trying to help them do. And then really connect them in with investors who can grow them. What do you think the greatest challenge that you guys are facing right now? I think this is going to be, that's a great question. <laughs> and I'm going to give you a strange answer. But I think the greatest challenge that I find on both sides of the ocean is a charity mindset. And I, I know that sounds strange, but it's this is a hard space to invest in. And part of the reason I, I love talking to guys like you, Daniel, is that you know you and your listeners get investment. You know what it's like to create value. And yet when we go to charity, for the last 50, 60 years, America has been, it's been inculcated in America that Charity is about buying food and like just giving it to people. And it's it's a black hole where money just goes down and it never develops the economies of any place. And part of what we're trying to help people see is, look, all of that ROI that you got out of investments, it's coming from the fact that you're building something of value on the ground. You're yeah. creating something that can then be reinvested in and you're, you're building a valuable thing that then creates more value and that's where you get your return. When you take your charitable co- capital, when you take your DAF money or or whatever resources you have there, why not put it into the same kind of value creation, but do it in that high risk startup space where we need to we need to diversify broadly. We need to like help 300 people before we get the 10 or the 15 that really start growing something. It may not create a lot of ROI, but the ROI that happens gets yeah. reinvested into that space, then that community doesn't need the feeding program ever again because right. now they're feeding themselves. That's the, I mean, as as believers, as Christians, isn't our calling to love people and to actually change their lives, not just make poverty less painful for the moment? You know, when we be, you know, that child is hungry because he's poor. Yes. And you give him food, he's still poor. It hasn't changed his situation. If we change their environment, we're genuinely loving them in a way that is going to change their lives and actually be able to help them grow in a way that they don't need us anymore, which is what we want. We want them to be able to stand up on their own. And that's what eCatalyst is trying to do, is trying to create the community-wide solution yeah. that can actually bring people off of charity. Yeah, and I think the biggest revelation for me was you know, seeing that we can have so much greater impact if we think beyond just our philanthropy and yes. and say wait a second we can use our entire portfolio of investments depending yes. on where we're investing them to be mm-hmm. kingdom investments and yes. and to really you know change change lives through that and so yes. it's really incredible to to meet all these different people that are doing things like this and and talk with them about it because I think, you know, part of the reason that we even have the podcast is to get exposure to people like that and to people like you. And because we we don't realize it's an option, we don't look for it. And so, right. you know, once we realize it's an option, we're like, oh, wow, that's that's incredible. So we've got to yep. you know, look into, OK, how do we actually do that and, and who do we do that with and, and everything. So, yeah, and, and Daniel, just one more thought about that, too. I mean, you think you're talking about people's whole portfolios and really using them in a way that changes things. Take your charitable dollars and help build up that high risk space so that you can find the things that you can then invest in on an impact level. And then those can grow and actually start investing them on a truly for profit level. Uh You can take all of your capital from various different levels of it, but use it in a way that creates the same kind of value and actually changes the economy. That's that's 
that would be my challenge to, to your listeners and to, to other people who really understand what investment looks like. Is let's let's use our let's use the whole portfolio and let's really create the kind of value that you know that you can create. Yeah, absolutely. So turning to you, then, what is the greatest investment that you've you've made personally? Oh, I think you know I've I've told a number of people recently that you know this has been hard. For me, I've never started a nonprofit before. I've started for profits before, so this is my first nonprofit. Yep. I'm starting for profits with my nonprofit, but I'm I'm still starting a nonprofit, and it is it's hard. It has been really really difficult. But at the same time, I feel a convergence of so many different parts of my life in a lot of ways. All of the cross cultural experience that I've had. I've been in like 51 different countries. I've learned three books. I, I think it's various different points, including Creole, like five different languages. Right. You know, it's that part. And then there's the teaching. I've done a lot of teaching stuff and then business, you know, and all of it comes together in a way that I feel like I'm now going to work with those moon of the people who are poor. And I'm actually doing something that I feel like is genuinely benefiting them. Not because I'm coming down as a white guy and saying, oh, okay, now everything's going to be better. It's because I'm able to come up underneath them and say, you guys can do this. Let me help you. Let me, let me be the, the wind at your back and, and see you guys really succeed. Yeah, that's really good. Thank you. So how can, how can somebody get involved in what you're doing? There's a, there's a lot of different ways. Obviously, you know, we need, we need charitable capital just to keep all of this running. We're looking for some investment capital, both for our entities that are over there for the for the Ethiopian entity right now and then ultimately for some of the businesses that get spun off. Um, yeah. So we're looking for the for capital for all of that. But but I'm also really looking for guys who can help invest in some of these entrepreneurs. One of the things I've I've been wanting to do and we want to try to put something together for this summer is to take a uh, and let's call it a short term mission trip as it were for business guys. Yeah. But you know, not to go over and build a church someplace or to pass out tracks or something like that. But you guys have got skills that that entrepreneurs over there need. Well, yeah. come with us and put your skills to use in a way that can transform the economy of a place. Well, you know, let's go over. Let's do a let's do a big workshop. Let's do an event. We'll get people excited about what entrepreneurship is because here are all these American businessmen not coming over to give money out, but to give out skills that they can then use to change their own lives. And then let's. Let's invest in these entrepreneurs. Let's make something really amazing happen. So yeah, so I would I, I know some of your some of your listeners are business people. I'd love to have some of them join us for uh, for something that could really uh, use their skills in a, in a way that really has an impact. Yeah, that's really exciting. That that seems like a really neat opportunity. What would you advise somebody on taking their generosity to the next level? Well, I think all of these things. In other words, think about not just the money that you're giving. And, and I mean, that is the first step. You've got to think about, okay, I'm willing to part with this amount of money or this amount of resource or something else. That's part of our, our journey when we're first getting to be generous. Yeah. But then really, I, I would challenge your listeners, don't, don't just stop there and then just give away the money. Think about where are you giving that money that can have a genuine impact that's really going to change things. Again, people are poor. People are, are suffering because... They're poor. You know, people don't have clean water because they're poor. They don't have food because they're poor. If we invest in those things, we're helping. We're helping make poverty less painful. But wouldn't it be better if we could actually change poverty completely and actually allow a community to really develop itself so that it doesn't need charity anymore and then do it someplace else? So I would I would really encourage your your listeners, and, and it doesn't have to be through eCatalyst. It could be through any other in, number of things. But to really think through, what's the impact that I want to have with this money? How do I want to use this money in a way that genuinely changes an environment? Yeah, that's good. So is there anything else that you want to share with our listeners before we jump into the Mentor Minute? Sure. I think a couple of things, uh, just some resources that I think are really helpful. If you haven't read When Helping Hurts by Corbin and Fickert, you definitely need to get out and get that book. It's a fantastic book. I also was just reading Poverty of Nations by Wayne Grudem, teamed up with an, uh, with an economist and also some, some amazing stuff. And of course, we've got stuff on our website, which is eCatalyst, eCatalyst.org, literally. There's some stuff about the missing middle. Go look at the video on the missing middle. You'll find it, I think, really enlightening about what what poverty 
the, the roots of poverty and how we can really start solving them. So those would be all things that I think would be would be valuable. And again, if you have any inclination, come with us to Ethiopia and do something really amazing with your uh, with your summer. Yeah, that's good. All right. So I had one other question about, you know, we were talking a lot about poverty and alleviation. And what is maybe the number one thing that you've seen that lifts people out of poverty? Sorry about that. The number one thing that lifts people out of poverty is hope, I think. Yeah. I think being poor is lacking resource. And we look at that, we assume that that is also poverty, but I don't think that's poverty. Poverty is not having the ability to make a dent in the problems that you have in your life. Uh -huh. Giving somebody a meal solves the poor, the lack of resource for the moment, but it doesn't change the system. What we really need, if we're going to solve poverty, we need to give people a vision for a pathway out, a chance to be able to say, I don't want my kids to live in the same dirt floor, tin roof house that I live in. I want to I want to start a business. I want to start doing something that's different and change my life. And a lot of places, especially in the developing world, people just don't have the opportunity to do that. That's what we're about is really trying to come in and say, let's give people the opportunity. Not everybody's going to start a business, but those that want to, when everybody who wants to has the opportunity to do so, we're starting to see real change. I think that's what changes is communities. It's not charity. It's not aid. It's the, the capacity, the opportunity to create something into which we can hope. Mm. Yeah, that's really, that's a great answer. Thank you for that. All right, who is the most influential person that you know and how have they impacted you? Most influential person I know and how have they impacted me? Wow, you're going to have to edit out this long, quiet pause. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great question. I'm not sure if I'd even, let me think about this. I've had a lot of mentors in my life. I've had a lot of people that that I would say have had some significant influence over me in one form or another. I don't I don't know that I could really lift one up. There was a guy named Scott Walker that 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 helped me a tremendous amount when I was in Boston in my seminary days. There's guys here that I feel like Ray Barra, Henry Kastner is doing some amazing stuff. I think there's a lot of people that are out there doing some great stuff in uh, in poverty alleviation. Not just alleviation, but solving. I think I want to get away from that word sometimes. I don't want to alleviate poverty. I want to help solve. I want to help people solve their own poverty situations. I think some of the, you know what, how about this? I think some of the most influential people that I've come across in the last couple of years have been some of these entrepreneurs. There's a couple of these guys that have really just taken on the mantle of saying, I want my life to be different. I want my community to be different. And they invest the time and the G against all odds. They're risking their financial future to some extent or another in order to create something that that changes their lives, the lives of their families and the lives of the people around them. Our leader in Ethiopia, the guy named Ahmed, he's 30 years old. He's a young guy, but he has a vision for Ethiopia to change it and to really transform it. And I, I just, I'm excited to, to work with this guy. I feel like he is, he's just an amazing guy. And I want to invest in him. So I hope that's, I'm meandering a bit. But <laughs> oh, that's, that's good. Somewhat of, a, somewhat of an answer to your question. Yeah. And then do you have a book or podcast that you would recommend? I know you recommended a couple of resources, but do you have anything else? Sure. Sure. I would say, I mean, When Helping Hurts, I think is, is a foundational look at why charity needs to change. Why we need to really think differently about the way charity works. There's another group called Toxic, another book called Toxic Charity. I can't remember who wrote that one, but that's also a very good one. Yeah, there's, I think, I think those are, those are some, some very good resources. I, I guess I would just refer back to what I've already said. Yeah. Go to our website, take a look at Problem in the Missing Middle. What is, what is your web address? The web address is ecatalyst.org. So E C A T A L Y S T dot org. Perfect. And then last question is, what is the greatest lesson in leadership that you've learned? Greatest lesson in leadership. I think, you know, when I first got out of college, I, I was working with troubled kids and it was tough. It was really, really hard stuff. And it brought out every issue that I wish it had never existed in my own life as I'm trying to trying to help these kids deal with their own issues. I think one of the things that I realized, there was, there was an older guy that was there that would come out. He was he had been one of the founders of these therapeutic camping programs years and years before. Chief Mac, we used to call him. Chief Mac would say, you know, if you're not growing, the boys aren't going to grow either. Yes. If you're if you're not willing to take serious look at yourself, deal with the realities of your own brokenness and your own 
deficiencies. Nobody around you is going to do it either. So I think as leaders, we've got to lead from that place of brokenness. Instead of instead of saying, you know, I'm up on this level and you're down at this level and I'll help you up to my level, that's that's how I'll lead. Instead, coming alongside somebody, and I this is part of what I find so amazing. These guys coming out of impoverished areas are some of them are brilliant. Some of them are just and just amazing, amazing people. And for me to come in above them is just wrong. Yeah. So for me to come alongside them and said and say, it's not that I have everything that I need, but what we need is over there. And whether that's, you know, a walk with God, whether that's a, a business that, that can change our community, it's over there. Let's walk together to go find that. And I think good leadership identifies with people in a way that says, I am not the solution, but I will help us get there. I'm going to do everything I can to, to help get us there. Thank you, Thomas, for coming on the podcast. This is really good to, to hear about eCatalyst and everything that you guys are doing through that. Really enjoy it. Is there anything that we can be praying for for you or eCatalyst? Sure. Pray that pray that we find some some business guys to want to come out this summer. Pray that that the cohorts that are getting started in the next few months really start well and that we get some good communities of people. We get people who are really hungry to build businesses and that we can launch these things in a way that's going to be really going to keep things growing. Like we launched the last one, but these next few are going to be key to, to seeing the model move forward. All right. Can we pray right now? Please. Let's pray. God, I thank you and praise you for this time with Thomas. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would be with eCatalyst and the cohorts that are starting up, the trip that's being planned. Lord, we want to serve you and glorify you and love our neighbors. Lord, I pray that you would allow us to to really think about how we do that effectively and how we can serve them. In Christ's name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for listening to another episode of the Kingdom Investor Podcast. 